welcome to a morning talk show. Um, today I'm going to bring you my conversation with Lucian Greaves. Um, Lucian is a co-founder and um, kind of head of an organization called the Satanic Temple. And they had a documentary made, out, uh, made about them called Hail Satan. It has a question mark at the end. And um, I watched that documentary during the time when I was considering starting a podcast. And it was one of the things that kind of crystallized in my mind that I, I did want to start a podcast and that um, Lucian was actually someone I specifically wanted to interview. So um, I was thrilled to be able to get in touch with him and thrilled that he uh, agreed to let me interview him. Um, now, the Satanic Temple is like one of many reasons I wanted to do this interview was that, you know, being from an evangelical Christian background, um, the, you know, the name Satan and, and the concept um, has a lot of history for me and a lot of, you know, fear-based reactions. So I was really surprised in the documentary that, um, you know, this whole kind of new, um, this whole new angle on the character of Satan uh, came to light. And uh, I'm not a Satanist. I'm not directly promoting uh, Satanism or antagonizing Satanism, but what came became clear to me in the process of uh, watching the documentary, process of wa watching the documentary, haha, uh, in watching the documentary was that um, their commitment to religious pluralism in the United States was admirable and that in some ways their existence makes sense and and I can certainly see why it, it appeals to people and why people are drawn to it. And there's a certain wisdom even in it. And Lucian kind of crystallizes it all um, in that he he has that kind of um, mischievous vibe about him, but he also has a deep love and care for not just people, but actually for the United States. Um, and for his country, it's, it's, it was oddly patriotic. Um, and so, yeah, he was just a compelling guy. Um, and I also kind of knew that if I could speak to Lucian and find, you know, wisdom and, um, interesting ideas and, and, and new thoughts being provoked, that it would, it would be almost like a proof of concept for this whole podcast. Um, one of the things about this interview um, that didn't go as I had planned was I usually get my guests to kind of briefly describe themselves. And that was going to be the part where um, we talked about who Lucian is and, and, and what the organization does. Um, but it became clear early on that he he's kind of had, he's had enough of that. And also just based on kind of the, I could just sense a reticence based on, understandably, uh, based on how th people would generally approach him. So many people would, would approach him wanting him to justify himself. So I appreciated that he was reticent to do that or, or just, just didn't have any interest in doing that. So we kind of jump into the conversation. So if you um, find this conversation interesting, um, I encourage you to watch the documentary for sure, either way. Um, do a bit more research. Um, you can see that the Satanic Temple does a lot of things. They actually have religious practices that they engage in. Um, they're a humanist organization. They, they don't believe in, they're non-theistic, so they don't believe in a literal being called Satan. And so you can kind of, um, you can kind of get a, a sense of it. There's, there's plenty of internet content um, about that, so I encourage you to do that. Um, but that being said, um, I felt like it was a great conversation. I felt like um, we got in a groove and, and Lucian um, kind of displayed a, an openness to just this being a real conversation and not being something where he was promoting anything or I was promoting anything. I identify myself as um, being from a Christian background, being involved in Christianity in, to some degree still. Uh, so anyway, talking too much again, like and subscribe to this video. Uh, and and leave comments, please. 
um, with your perspectives and uh, with things I may have missed. If you're from the Satanic Temple, please you know, let me know what I've gotten wrong or misrepresented. If you're, whatever, just, just I, wanna, I wanna chat about uh, these things that we talk about. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Lucian Greaves. Okay, uh, so welcome to uh, the morning talk show. Um, Lucian Greaves, I, I'm a fan of yours. I saw the, the documentary, um, which a lot of people saw, Hail Satan. And, oh yeah, uh, I saw that one. Yeah, you saw that one, it sounds familiar. Uh, I, 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 and like I said to you on Twitter, it's kind of one of those things, like I, I was starting a podcast already and then seeing that documentary and seeing you as just this, uh, this figure in this kind of almost reluctant figure, um, in the documentary, but with this passion, I was just like, um, it, it was one of the things it, you were one of the people that inspired me to really want to do the podcast for real. So it's, it's a real honor to, to have you on. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, so just for, um, because the, the, my podcast doesn't usually center around, uh, uh, Satanist topics. Uh, can you describe briefly how you, how you sort of describe yourself and, and the satanic temple to people? I've stopped describing myself to the to people anymore. Uh, sure. <laughs> there's quite a, quite enough of material. Um, you know, now there's a documentary, but, uh, at the end of this month or the beginning of next month, the book comes out by Ox, uh, published by Oxford university press written by a religion scholar, Joe Laycock, who was writing about us from our very inception really. Mm. And, uh, it, that also gives a good kind of background overview of the beginnings in philosophy of the satanic temple. But uh, mm -hmm. after like seven or eight years now, people arguing whether this should be viewed as a legitimate religion, people questioning our authenticity, people asking uh, ad nauseum what we're about and everything. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a bit difficult to not uh, suffer a bit of burnout, but at least, uh, you know, I, I guess that's uh uh, a natural pattern that, that works out for the best because in the beginning that material isn't available at the time that it is, you know, right. you, you have the luxury of kind of, uh, of kind of indulging that, that burnout after a while. But yeah, yeah, at this point, I pretty much, uh, direct people to the, to the materials and we have, a, a, a quite a wealth of information available online, mm -hmm. which again, of course, makes the, uh, some of the ignorant questions thrown at, Twitter, as though that's just a form on uh, you know, all day long, every day. Uh, that makes that kind of dynamic all the more infuriating. Yeah, absolutely. I can, and I can fully understand that. Like, uh, it, it, I, I appreciate one of the things I appreciated about uh, about the the way you were portrayed in the in the documentary was um, that kind of. Um, I guess that kind of action-based, action-oriented personality that you had where um, you had no interest in, I mean, for, correct me if I'm wrong, you had no interest in kind of uh, sort of selling anything on the strength of your charisma or on the strength of your, of your personality. Like you had, you had, you seemed to have a mission um, that was primary. Um, yeah, and I certainly didn't think I had any uh, any photogenic charisma in the traditional sense, for sure. I, I didn't think I was, uh, you know, even from my own point of view, I didn't feel like I was a a market marketable central person, especially because I, especially in the beginning, I I really had reservations about speaking in front of crowds, the same as anybody yeah. else, I guess. I didn't think I would ever become acclimated to it, but it was such a trial by fire. You know, when we first started doing what we were doing, I don't think people realized how much we were in the news. A lot of people only heard of us from the documentary, but right. when I first started taking on that role, I was doing interviews all the time. Yeah. And to be fair, a lot of them were local interviews, wherever yeah. we were doing, whatever we were doing. But to me, it's all one and the same, you know, it, yeah. it, uh, and that's how you become acclimated. And it's a, I've always had a certain social awkwardness and, uh, and, uh, in, in a real discomfort being in crowds and it's weird to see yeah. how uh my mentality has changed over time 
now it's far more uncomfortable for me to be uh, a part of the crowd where everybody's coming up asking. It's nice meeting people who this resonates for, but right. when it's a whole crowd of people, it can be, it can burn you out and be really oppressive. Yeah. But the funny part is, is like now in a crowded environment, I much prefer being on the stage than uh, right. than anything else. So and uh, I guess you can't help but have these situations you're in change you over time. And yeah. I've been very cognizant of that and tried to not make those changes uh, occur for the worse. Right. So you have noticed a, a change. You, you've noticed a change in your your ability to be in the spotlight since kind of, you mean since the documentary or since just uh, becoming the spokesman of the church? Or the, uh, since being a, a public person that people, yeah. you know, that people take my opinion seriously. Uh, you know, before I was as guilty as anybody of saying things I didn't need, uh, I didn't mean, you know, bombastic things for humor value or uh, now I feel like, I don't even openly want to say if I think uh, a certain artist's music sucks or, you know, right. a movie I saw was bad or whatever, because I'm amazed at who notices now. It right. was just uh, uh, an interview I did in Metal Hammer magazine where I was talking about bands I like, and I didn't yeah. expect those bands to notice. But I mentioned one of the bands that I like, and uh, they were excited. They noticed that I had said that. Now I'm working on a side music project with a couple of guys from that band. Oh, cool. I think I'm really glad I didn't go off on some tirade about music I think sucks, except for Justin Bieber. I did go off on a tirade about how I thought his stuff sucks, but I don't sure. regret that because I don't think there was ever a chance <laughs> to look at that and have his feelings hurt. Yeah, no, he, he doesn't seem like musically or personality wise, he's in your, uh, he, he's, he's anywhere close. And yeah, he's also part of some uh, anti-gay megachurch scam. Okay. Thing, so yeah. Yeah, but if but if Bieber is listening to this podcast, um, I hope he knows he can come to either one of us and repent uh, and change his ways. No, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, if Bieber listens, I would like him to know, of course, that I, I don't like to denigrate anybody's music, and I like right. to, I don't like to put people down. But he can still go fuck himself because fuck him <laughs> stuff is terrible. <laughs> thank you yeah don't hold back don't hold back no um but i appreciate i appreciate what you're saying like because i i'm also a, a musician and performer and i'm i'm very much in the same boat of like not like feeling super weird in crowds like feeling very strange and kind of panicky um and then up on stage there's this weird safety that you feel um i mean well, I, or I was something with some guys who were doing uh, music professionally well before I was doing the Satanic Temple. And I would watch these guys go off on stage and I was thinking, I wonder if I could ever be comfortable with that, you know, yeah. like uh, just going out and perform because they were, you know, they've been at it for a long time, but I still felt it just seemed all too casual to them to just be able to walk out in front of an enthusiastic crowd and start playing like it was just another another day at the office or whatever. Yeah. And it was funny because I caught up with them after having done, you know, several public appearances and going on Fox or whatever. Yeah. And the front man of the band was just like, I don't think I could ever do what you do. That kind of, you know, debating environment, that kind of scrutiny. Right. Something I, I, so it made me realize that is completely different. And I did a couple of music shows in Philadelphia over a year ago. Uh, me and some of the people I work with did some soundtracking for uh, an old silent film, Haxon, and we performed the live soundtracking. Cool. And a couple of shows over there. And uh, I actually felt that that was a much more comfortable kind of environment than doing a lecture or certainly doing a debate. The debates by their nature are confrontational, but even when you do a lecture afterwards, everybody kind of comes up to you and takes it as an opportunity to elaborate different points you're talking about and all that's fine but just yeah. all at once in a whole crowd it, it can get to be a bit much no absolutely play the music you know it was people coming up and saying oh love what you do love what you did here uh, right you know get an autograph or whatever and then they go and i was thinking this is this is a lot better you know <laughs> and plus you can have a few drinks while you're doing uh doing music performances and i don't feel it necessarily 
I think if you, you, you of course, if you go over the line, it's going to compromise, but having a few sure. will just loosen you up. And uh, Yeah. We'll no, make. I know exactly. I know all about that. It's a lot different than having to be on point with a Q&A, you know? Yeah. Well, and the difference too, when you're doing some kind of musical performance is that the people who don't like it don't typically want to approach you uh, to refute uh, the, no right. the notes you played. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, fuck you, man. You played F minor, you know, like, I don't know. But yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it, it, what you do is so interesting and unique because, um, and I don't think I could do it either at this point in my life because you, you really do inspire people to, um, I mean, most people are not apathetic. They're, they're either, they're motivated one way or the other by what you're doing. And so you must receive a lot of um, negativity. Even in, the, even in the documentary, you had to put on a bulletproof vest um, and, and at one point. And, that, and, and, not, and like it was a legitimate use of a bulletproof vest. It wasn't like a, what was that Interpol band where the guy always wore a bulletproof vest as a, to look cool. Like, and, and so that, that popped into my mind when I told you there was safety on stage just a minute ago. I was like, oh, I just, said, I just told a guy who's had to wear a bulletproof vest that there's safety. I felt a little cheated that the documentary missed the people who were actually loitering around the, uh, the rally area with guns. There were people there with guns and wanted us to know that they were there. Holy and, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there were people like sending off all kinds of signals just across the street from us. It's open carry territory on the, uh, on the Capitol grounds itself, which was just like on the grass before the building or whatever. Man. You, you couldn't come armed, but there were, there were all kinds of people armed and it was actually, uh, uh, a vice cameraman who chased off a couple guys with guns just by going up to them with his camera and starting to ask them questions and then they, oh, right. they took off so i felt like you know i felt like putting on the bulletproof vest really looked dramatic and i was like all right now if nobody like shows up with guns or anything this is going to look like yeah this is going to look like real you know drama like i'm i'm playing this up or whatever yeah so so I was almost, I was almost a, uh, a bit disappointed when, when uh, those characters were neither in the Vice piece nor in the, uh, the documentary. But, but I assure yeah. you, the, the threat was real. Oh, I, I'm from the southern U.S. and I've got family down there. And I, I guess there are maybe people up here in Canada where I live who might see something like that and, and just assume based on, on how f seldom we see anybody packing heat that uh that that was just be you being dramatic but i i immediately knew that based on where you were and what you were doing that the threat was real um, yeah and now now uh you know we're getting to the point with the arkansas case and i guess in case people don't know what we're fighting is to have a satanic monument erected on the public grounds because they saw fit to put a privately donated Ten Commandments monument and right. the government can't discriminate regarding viewpoints. Uh, right. They can't show preference towards one religious point of view over another. So we feel it's really their obligation to also take a, a private donation of, of our satanic monument. Mm -hmm. They flat out said no, uh, how they think they can, you know, make a case uh, for this is, is really unclear even now as we right. uh, litigate. But now they want to bring me in for discovery, which is when they, uh, you know, I go into the offices and the lawyers ask me a bunch of questions, take my deposition. And it seems like their tactic is to maybe try to intimidate me out of this case because it mm -hmm. looks like they're trying to cast this broad net and ask me a bunch of personal, private questions, identifying information to put on public record because right. they you know, don't want to do that. So that's what we're kind of pushing uh, back against right now. And the senator, you see uh, Jason Rapert, who fought to put the Ten Commandments up at the Arkansas yeah. State Capitol. He's done everything he can to release identifying information about me publicly to the point where we did his depositions, where our lawyers went in and asked him his questions, put him on record. And I was going to be at those depositions and he decided to advertise on social media the time and the place that this was going to happen and that I was going to be there. So it seems clear to me that, uh, that the senator in Arkansas is, uh, is uh, 
I would say it's not too going too far to say he's uh, indirectly threatening my life. Right, especially because uh, of the area that you're in, the Bible Belt and all that, or that, that it's taking place in. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah, and there was some kind of neo-Nazi group that was openly calling for people to do whatever they could to, to stop us. Uh, you know, they would stop just short of issuing actual uh, proclamations that they were going to come kill us. But they were making it clear that, right. uh, that, that, that this was their, that these were their feelings. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm certain that, that the Senator knows exactly what he's, what he's doing, but that's the, that's the world we're living in now where yeah. senators exhibit that kind of behavior. Man, uh, like in, in the documentary, and I really hope that anyone listening to this watches it who hasn't, because it's really, you can't make up these people like, uh, like Senator Rapert, like, <laughs> you know, if you got an actor to play him, I don't think he could do any better of a job of just oozing that, like, uh, I, I know, I, I, yeah, that kind of smug, uh, self-assured kind of thoughtless, faith-driven, uh, yeah. theocratic behavior. You're Very right. Practice. You can't be satirized. Right. No. And, and they, and they, they got some great footage in the documentary where I could see people saying, you know, is this real? Like, uh, if you invented this character of Raper and you invented the, the Hail Satan story and had actors play it, I think people would say, oh, come on. That's a little heavy-handed. Because I, I talk to people all the time who don't even realize the, yeah. the state of affairs within the United States with the right. theocrats. They think, it's, they think I'm acting hysterical still when I say there's a concentrated effort to install a theocracy in the united states yeah you see characters like rapert on camera for this documentary his eyes rolling back in his head palms up to heaven saying we are yeah. what we believe in defense yeah. of putting the the ten commandments on you no up. we are what we do shithead <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no like yeah, yeah but it, people have to start taking politicians seriously when they say they have these superstitious beliefs i think we've been indoctrinated you know even non-believers from the beginning of their lives to feel that there's some kind of uh etiquette stigma against holding somebody's religious beliefs against them no matter how uh how deranged they are or, or how uh superstition driven they may be yeah and uh, to the point where we just accept politicians saying they hold these really bizarre irrational beliefs yeah. and hold this kind of prohibition against uh against calling those into question at all and i think we're seeing the ultimate outcome of that now well uh, and, oh sorry go ahead no no I, I was just gonna say including in australia where the prime minister has uh done so so little to address about two-thirds of the goddamn uh, island on fire at this yeah. point, but he's been pushing to uh, to uh, preserve the religious liberty of those who want to discriminate against gay couples. I mean, yeah, it, it, it doesn't does, get stupider. Yeah, like it. I, what I notice is that politicians, and I'm I'm like, I, I just have the hardest time drumming up any enthusiasm for any politician ever but they become a they become a uh a totem or like it the animus or the spirit of of their what they perceive to be their the public you know and and they they see the power behind you know like the political power behind the um religious right and they they become like you know the I would be interested to see people like Rapert when they were young and all that, you know, because I feel like they become these monsters, like, you know, these monsters, like a megazord of, of all of the, uh, you know, beliefs of the people that they think will, will give them power and, and, and they end up fighting for things that are just, yeah, like you say, just, uh, they're distractions from the, the yeah, work well, of humanity. I mean, look at Trump. I, I think there's very few who, actually think he's some kind of true believer in any spiritual or religious sense yeah. but at the point where uh copping to those beliefs or or uh feigning those beliefs uh brings 
back so much. Yeah. In power gain, yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's a dysfunctional spiral for sure. Yeah, and I and like uh, to be honest, I'm I'm from the Christian tradition. I'm still somewhat involved myself. Like I still, I mean, I I pray. I I um, I, I, I read the Bible. But when Trump got elected, and I saw people treating him as a believer. I thought, well, the, the a believer means nothing anymore. You know, it, it, it's an it's an absolutely meaningless term if someone as as unkind as him. I mean, on just a personal level, can be called that. You know, like and it's, well, it's well, just watch, oh, just just watch. Next next time there's a Democrat in office, and he or she does something like. Uh, uh, has a, uses the wrong turn of phrase. It's a man who fails to wear a tie at some point or whatever. You are going to see those same people who were saying Trump was the chosen one also saying that they have never seen such an undignified presence in the Oval Office. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's the blindness, um, th the blindness of of this kind of thing. Um, yeah. And one thing that another thing that comes through in the documentary is just how uh, committed to sort of uh, ethics and process the Satanic Temple was in comparison with those who, you know, like there's never a good reason given why uh, a another monument couldn't be on the ground. I mean, there's never a legal reason given or, or, or anything like that, which is the only thing they could really appeal to. Yeah, it's funny. Um, when we first started, we weren't going to seek tax-exempt status because we thought the, the better fight was to fight against tax exemption for religious organizations because, I mean, let's, let's face it, these churches anymore are not the uh, kind of communal centers that they used to be within, you know, the, the town square. They're, they're right. businesses of their own. They're buying up prime real estate, they're running huge multi-million dollar enterprises and it's all tax free. So we thought, you know, we lead by example and be the religious organization that didn't accept tax exemption. But what we didn't expect were was that we would have these arguments when we would take things into litigation saying, well, you're not a legitimate religion, so therefore you don't have any, uh -huh. any say in this matter. It, which is just bizarre because, uh, you know, we, we asked, to, we, we've we got uh, two trials going into, uh, uh, going to, we've got two trials pending now, one in Scottsdale, where we asked to give an invocation before a city council meeting. And then, of course, we have Arkansas, and it seems like uh, both of them are going to argue that we're not real religions. And that's strange to me because we wouldn't have to be for our claims to even have legitimacy. I don't even see how that's an argument. Uh, right. We didn't have to be a religion to offer, to give yeah. an invocation in Scottsdale. Yeah. Uh, they, they, a religious they, argument. Right, right. And even, in, uh, and even in Arkansas, they were claiming that the Ten Commandments monument isn't a religious monument to begin with. So I don't know where they're getting the idea that now they can impose the standard that one needs to be a legitimate religion. It seems backwards. But yeah. they're even making these arguments now, even after the point where we decided that since these arguments were being made against us, we would seek our IRS tax exempt status. And the thing that really pushed us over the edge for that was when Trump announced he was going to gut the Johnson Amendment. And the Johnson Amendment is what keeps, uh, what keeps religious groups that have tax exempt status from engaging in politics. They're not supposed to engage in politics and they, they get their tax exempt status. Well, you know, without the Johnson Amendment, uh, the tax exempt status was nothing but a, uh, a hindrance to us. It was nothing but a disadvantage we had been put at. And also, mm. of course, I thought that would prevent anybody from trying to take the argument all the way to trial that we're not a legitimate religion but it seems like that's the only argument they can come up with uh whether it has anything to do with the question at hand or not that's uh, the card they're going to play both in scottsdale and in arkansas yeah. so i uh, i mean beyond that um i don't know how they 
I, I haven't seen any other way in which they can legitimately argue their case. We haven't seen it yet. Mm. Have Have you, I'm just curious, have you had much um, either vocal or private um, affirmation from, from any, from any Christian groups or people saying, Hey, look, uh, we see the legitimacy of what you're doing. Any encouragement of that kind? Oh yeah. In fact, um, in the hail Satan film, uh, you know, you see that the, the rally in Arkansas where we brought the Baphomet monument on the grounds just for the day for that rally. Right. It's like the climax of the, of the film. And yeah. I give a speech up at this podium, but what you don't see is that there's speakers before me. I was kind of like the headlining act. I, I walked up there last, but other members of the Satanic Temple came to speak. But there were also a couple of Christian ministers from Arkansas, which was really a risk for them. You know, like um, I was at risk for getting shot that very day. You know, yeah. And there was a lot of chatter towards that end, and a lot, a lot of reason to believe that somebody was going to make some kind of effort to do me harm that day. But at least I don't live there. You know, right. And there were in some, uh, some of the there were a couple of Christian ministers that came to speak uh, and they knew, they knew the Baphomet was going to be there. They knew, I mean, this wasn't misrepresented to them. They, they, they knew the issue and they understood yeah. its importance and they understood that what the satanic temple was doing wasn't just trying to force Satanism into the public, public square. It yeah. was preserving plur pluralism and it was preserving government viewpoint neutrality. We're saying right. that the government doesn't have the right to tell you, which religious point of view to take. It doesn't have the right to preference one religion over another. And I think, you know, Christians who are secure in their, their faith and don't find people with other beliefs to be a, a, uh, a clear and present danger to them, yeah. they don't have any problem with that. Right. And that's something that, uh, that guys like Raper don't want you to know. You know, Raper's right. been... Uh, very keen to put out this message that, you know, this is Satanists attacking Christian values or that these are people outside of Arkansas attacking the state of Arkansas. Um, but he's, he's a, he's a sinister little liar. And yeah. um, the fact of the matter is, is his Ten Commandments effort didn't originate in Arkansas either. He refused to answer these questions when we put him under deposition, but it's clearly a part of Project Blitz. Project Blitz is a nationwide effort to install theocracy in the United States. It involves the Congressional Prayer Caucus and other organizations that put together model legislation, like the legislation that called for the Ten Commandments Monument to be on the grounds in Arkansas. Yeah. It was almost the exact same wording in Oklahoma. And in each of these states where these things come up, they act like these are homegrown grassroots efforts within their home state. Huh. And the fact of the matter is that that is not at all accurate. People like Raypert are just mindless little tools for a larger theocratic effort that people should pay attention to. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So I didn't know about Project Blitz. It's yeah, Project Blitz is responsible for all the efforts now to put in God we trust in all the public schools. Um, Project Blitz was also responsible for legislation that uh, it, a lot of a lot of anti-abortion legislation, mm -hmm. the legislation in Ohio that uh, that proclaimed that students uh, couldn't be marked wrong for giving a wrong answer so long as that wrong answer was in, in line with their religious beliefs. And what was funny is the lead sponsor of that bill denied knowing anything about Project Blitz or having any connection to the Congressional Prayer Caucus. And The Guardian found out that he was, in fact, co-chair of the Ohio uh, Prayer Caucus. So uh, <laughs> apparently there's a code of silence. Like I said, uh, Raper would not speak to the, uh, uh, to the revision history of the Ten Commandments Bill in Arkansas. He claimed legislative immunity from having to answer any such questions under deposition, which was, uh, which was something that was flabbergasting to oh. all the lawyers in the room. But that, that's uh, uh, apparently a uh, project so he invoked you know, without it doesn't, doesn't like to be spoken of. Yeah. So he invoked that verbally, like you said, legislative what? Yeah, he, 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 uh, he invoked some kind of legislative immunity from having to answer these questions. And uh, there were lawyers from the ACLU, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and the Satanic Temple there 
And I was looking around to these lawyers and they were saying they, they had never heard of this kind of immunity being used in this way, that it's a very limited type of immunity that huh. had to do with the internal workings of some kind of legislation or whatever. Um, yeah. And even Rayford's own lawyers didn't seem sold on the idea. And I guess, you know, uh, there's probably going to be, there's probably been objections filed to the fact that he wouldn't answer basic questions. But, but there we are. Here it is, a public official passing legislation in the public's name and then refusing to answer questions about where that legislation came from. Wow. Well, the first rule of prayer caucus is you don't talk about prayer caucus, I guess. Yeah, that seems to be the case. <laughs> and uh, Project Blitz is, is something that uh, was kind of outed by uh, political research associates and local to me in the Cambridge area. And since then, Guardian has done a lot to write about it and other people have kind of followed up. But their whole playbook has been, uh, has been revealed publicly. Um, and they talk about these efforts to install monuments, to install on God we trust. And these are always kind of like first step efforts. I think when we started doing what we were doing, I thought we, we really grasped the problem as, as we still see it now and people are starting to wake up to it. We never thought this was merely some kind of hilarious thing and, and, uh, and a, well, why can't we type thing, but that right. there was a more serious issue going on here. Right. And uh, I think you see that in the Hail Satan film, when you see people saying that we don't have a right to speak in the public forum, yeah. because on dollar bills, it says, in God we trust. And there were more people than just the guy you see in the clip holding up the money. And we, we deal with this every time we, we, we do anything. People say yeah. that this is evidence. That the dollar yeah. bill says, in God we trust on it, and that means that we are a Christian nation, and there's an exclusive Christian privilege when it comes to the public square. Yeah. And, and it, thereby, you kind of see the, the utility in these monuments to them. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't stop with that. You know, the Ten Commandments monument being on the public ground next means that we're a Christian nation, therefore, you know, we don't respect gay marriage. Yeah. We... we you know, we, we, we allow discrimination in religion's name as long as it's the right religion. Uh, once you start giving exclusive access to public monies or the public square to one type of tribal affiliation, you certainly aren't, uh, you aren't even putting on a facade of pluralism anymore. Right. And that's a very dangerous route to go down. Right. Uh, yeah, agreed. Uh, one of the things I just want to go back to something you said a minute ago, how the um the baphomet statue and all wasn't uh just a hilarious joke like you're not a bunch of high school pranksters uh wanting to sort of vandalize the state grounds and uh, and and i that comes through that i definitely believe you when you say that but i also appreciated like there is a little bit of a trickster energy to what's going on with with um uh, with you guys and it's very hard to put into words because you're not being dishonest. It kind of brings up this, it kind of brings up this, uh, uh, this type of, uh, I guess, a trickster energy is the only thing I can think of to call it right now, which I've noticed having come up in Christianity. It's just like, it's not present in, in Christianity. It's like, it, it's sort of like the, I mean, the secrecy of something like the prayer um, caucus or whatever it was called. Um, the, the secrecy of that, it's, it's kind of shadow side, or maybe it's even the shadow side of what you guys are doing, which is being public about your, um, like being particularly public about, about your uh, pranks and tricks and. Right, right. Well, I mean, the, the great thing about Satanism is it kind of holds up a mirror, you know? And it shows that kind of backward mirror image and everything's been turned backward now to the mm. point where people say we're these inauthentic liars because of the fact that we're open about yeah. what we do and don't believe. Right. Right. We're, 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 we're willing to say we don't believe in, you know, the supernatural, but this is meaningful to us on, on right. a metaphorical kind right. of iconic level. And, you know, it's, it's amazing that every day we deal with people saying, well, so you're just admitting that you're, you're full of shit. And it's like, 
if we were full of shit, wouldn't we claim that we were, you know, that we were true believers? Like, at at what point does this, like, upfront, straightforward honesty uh, become to be recognized as such? I wrote a whole whole piece about this uh, that I tried to kind of convey these ideas as artfully as I could. And I can, I, uh, I compared us to the stage magician as, as opposed to kind of the uh, cult mystical guru who will learn like right. one crappy stage trick and try to convince people that it's real, you know, right. like the fake faith healers and things like right. that, as opposed to the honest magician on the stage doing sleight of hand and letting people know that it's all artifice, you know? Right. And it's like the audience I feel is, is enriched in the, in the other case you know in the case of the magician on the stage when they know it's all illusion it it helps them perhaps maybe think more critically about things you know they can still enjoy that uh that fascination that 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 uh that love for the unknown but they know there's a a way they could know it you know there's that exists in the material world yeah Uh, people who come to love the lie so much that they they have a backward uh perception of of what's what's true and what is not and it's i mean that kind of inversion was never more clear now i don't think when you see the the corruption and depravity of some of the evangelical theocrats and what they're doing to the Mm. point that i do think you know more christians even if uh even if the satanic temple will never be something they would join yeah they have a better understanding of what it means to us they, they yeah. at least have a better understanding of what it isn't right they, yeah. they know that we're not uh we're not criminal antisocial yeah. killers uh venerating evil you yeah. know this this idea well, of the opposition against tyrannical theocratic authority yeah. makes sense when that authority is actually uh, present and, and actively engaged, and that's that's the situation we're in now, and that's why mm. the Satanic Temple has grown is, right. in, in recent times so so extremely. Yeah, and let me throw out something because I think it's I think it's even a little deeper um, that the the cho- the choice of Satan as your symbol is a little deeper even than um, than what you're saying now. To me. Uh, you you choosing um, Satan as as the focal point is actually and it, please correct me I'm not speaking for you I'm throwing an idea out um, is actually an acceptance that you and all of us are a part of this of the same story so in other words instead of coming up with a god that you made up instead of like a a more legit flying spaghetti monster you took you are using the actual kind of antagonist from what has become the uh, the the narrative of the United States, the the narrative well, of that, the West. That's, that's that's the outcome, but the process of getting there isn't one in which we kind of sat around. We were like, well, "What kind of character or icon can we use for this?" Right. That never happened because for. You know, and of course, I don't speak to all people who even identify with us. But in my case, it wasn't like, well, you know, we got Satan, we got these other characters. Which which one do we take? Right. Like the Satan was just all it could be for us because that's kind of the the archetype and the kind of cultural, artistic, raw material we have that spoke to all these things. And it, of course, you know, Satan means something completely different to uh, to some of the you know some of the christians who 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 feel that uh what we're doing is completely wrong or some of the people who write right some of the catholics who write articles about us but yeah. maybe hopefully they can even see that there's more than one way of looking at things but yeah this notion of the adversary and, yeah. and that adversary being a, a embodied in satan really was kind of programmed into us and indoctrinated yeah. into us in a way that we couldn't have just we couldn't have just arbitrarily chosen yeah. another character. And that's one thing that is the most difficult for people to understand. Uh, if, if there's one, been one kind of continuous criticism I've had to push back against, it, it's that, that idea yeah. of 
why couldn't you choose something else? The idea that if you're non-theistic, then the, the characters, the, the metaphors, they're all arbitrary. Right. Not at all, you know, not, not, not in the least. But and otherwise, I think, you know, the characterization you have of the, yeah. the ultimate outcome from that is correct. Yeah, and it could be that my, my choice of the, because I, I had in mind exactly what you're also articulating. Not that it was a choice like you, you had, a, you had a, a meeting. It's like you, it, it's the no brainer, it's, it's the no brainer thing in a way. And it, and it does imply that you and, and these Christians are part of the same story, that you're not space aliens coming in, like uh, that, that Satan is a part of our collective story. And it's just that, um, that you're, you're choosing that kind of, um, uh, that free thinking uh, consciousness that Satan seems to represent in, in the Bible. And like, even, even in my, I, I, we did this interview quicker than I thought we would. Uh, so I didn't have as much time to, uh, to kind of research as, as, uh, as I would have liked to get things fresh in my mind. But I looked up Satan, uh, the Satan stories in the Bible. And when you look at them from a different perspective, uh, actually the Bible is, is amazingly um, non-judgmental of Satan in a weird way. Like Satan says his, Satan says his peace and he's got his, you know, like even, especially in the story of Adam and Eve, um, Satan, Satan, if Satan's not doing God's will in the story of Adam and Eve, then that is a weird story. You know what I mean? Right. Like, well, I mean, there's also the argument that Satan's never explicitly named as the serpent and that that oh, kind okay. of interpretation comes afterwards. But right. I mean, if you look at the, the book of Job, he seems to be kind of palling around with God and go. playing his game alongside God yeah. at the time. So... I forget what the death toll is, but people often like to throw out the death toll of uh, how many, how many people Satan was said to have killed in the Bible as opposed to God. And of course, you know, oh, it's there's, there's a there's a big disparity there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I and like uh, I, I'm not actually saying any of this because like I'm not a Satanist and. And I'm not specifically encouraging anybody to be a Satanist or not be a Satanist, but that, but I, I definitely, when you read the Bible from a different lens, uh, you know, cause I've always been, uh, been told all these, these stories, uh, and, and Satan is the, is the boogeyman and, and you never really, you never really think about it. And so I know you guys aren't saying that that Satan is a real, um, is a real being, but, um, I do, I do like the lens that it throws on, kind of consciousness and unconsciousness um yeah i mean back to that whole issue of people asking why did you have to choose satan like there's this this idea also that you know it's just outright offensive for people to take what is the icon of ultimate evil to some and and choose to uh to to hold it up as as this icon of nobility and i would almost be sympathetic to that if I thought for a moment that that mindset, that that belief in an ultimate evil that needs to be prosecuted at all times, Satan and his servants in earth was ever productive. And it's always been right. something that's caused so much harm. Right. right? And, and, yeah. and I think that obviously the better point of view, uh, the more productive, uh, uh, less, uh, less confrontational and uh and destructive point of view is one which accepts that you know people can view these things in different ways i i can accept christians thinking you know we we've gotten the story wrong somehow or that the better story at least is the one uh in which which jesus is the savior and satan is the villain but mm. to at least accept that there's a different way of looking at it you know right uh, from a kind of literary analysis at the very least. Absolutely. And I think, uh, I think if people understand that invoking the name Satan uh, doesn't automatically carry with it uh, right. homicide and criminality and everything else, canon and all those types of accusations, yeah. I mean, we're in a better place than if we insist that it does. Yeah. Well, it's hugely dangerous it's hugely dangerous to imply that evil will always have an obvious face like and that yeah. it won't and that it won't be from me it'll be from somebody else 
Right, right. Well, that, that gets us back to how mystifying it is in current times right now to see, you know, Trump venerated as as like uh, God's answer to the United States. Uh, it, it, it does. It still still amazes me, even after all this time. Yeah. What people will accept so long as there's a there's a cross tacked to it. It's, it's just so long as it waves the flag in front of it, uh, you know, and, and plants yeah. a cross in its ground that uh, that people assume that it, it's on the right side of every issue. And that's that's really uh, it's really become more and more disheartening. Yeah, this or that thing can't be evil um, because it it has the right, you know, it has the right pin on its coat or it has the right look or it says the right passwords or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a road to ruin. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, like something that the, the documentary uh, does a, a pretty good job of is the, the people who seem, uh, and I know there's probably some narrative, you know, choice of exactly which clips and everything, but the, the people like the newscasters and everyone who is opposing you in it, they seem to all represent this kind of shiny, dead-eyed, um, uh, pastel-colored, um, like sort of subset of human beings who's giving off every possible visual cue of non-evil. You know, like, uh, and yet I think for people like yourself and increasingly other people, myself included, it's becoming the look, the look and feel of evil now. Do you know what I mean? Like the look and feel. Uh, of evil like you know I was uh, this is a slight aside I was uh, unloading and loading gear one time outside of a venue and there was a goth club right next door and I remember someone I was with who was older was just terrified of these goths and wanted to stand there and and guard the car so that nothing got stolen and I realized at that time that like without even thinking about it I I in, just innately trusted these these goths more than like if there had been a, uh, some dudes in, in baseball hats standing there, um, you know, uh, with, you know, with muscle shirts on in the winter, um, I would have been, I would have been scared of those guys. And it was like, it's, it's sort of, it sort of brings up the idea that the, even the aesthetics, the percept, the perceived aesthetics of evil are making a, a full switch. How do you, how do you feel about that concept? No, I, I think you're right. I was speaking at a, uh, at a law school like a year ago something like that and uh it, it was it was at one of the higher end universities a uh, respected law school and and i was one of the speakers and the day before they had, had somebody from the obama administration speaking or whatever so it was it was kind of a big deal uh venue for me to speak at and i remembered uh watching people come in before i was speaking i was standing outside and there was like a glass hallway and i was looking at the people coming in below and the organizer came out and was just like bullshitting with me and all of a sudden we saw a whole pack of people in like black leather coats with spikes and like tattoos on their yeah. faces and stuff were coming and he started saying ah oh, man i this is this is terrible. I should have I should have never put this on social media because it was like a free event or whatever. I was telling him like, look, these are this is not the crowd that's going to shoot me. The crowd that's going to shoot me is going to be wearing a, a cardigan and khakis or something. Yeah, <laughs> you know? like, yeah. Like they, these people are fine. They're 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 on they're on my side. They're going to be respectful. But right. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, uh, I mean, the crowd that were carrying guns in Arkansas when we were over there it was completely like the baseball cap and, and khaki crowd. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And, and it's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was kind of um, the idea of monsters because I, I've had kind of a twofold feeling um, about sort of danger, the idea of danger and monsters and stuff like that. Because I've got a couple kids and there's a show about monsters like that they've watched, a little animated show where it's all of the monsters, all of the monsters from monster history, like uh, Frankenstein and the mummy and all that. But they're little kids. They're adorable. They got the big heads and the big eyes. And they're going to school. They're all going to like preschool together, or elementary school together. And there was something in me that was kind of offended by that, offended by taking 
the danger away from all these monsters. Like uh, some, some little part of me actually wanted to be like, okay, when my kid sees Frankenstein, I want him to be scared of, of it. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I, I'm wondering what, like, this is maybe too vague, but wondering what your, your thoughts are because um, in a way you're surrounded by monsters. I mean, you have, you have, a, you have a Baphomet behind you and, and uh, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful by using the word monster, but how do you feel about danger and fear in symbols? Um, based on no, what I'm saying. I, I think when, when people start demonstering these, these, uh, these, you know, humanoid grotesqueries or, or whatever, it, it's some kind of indication that people are gravitating more towards the outside. You know, they, they've gotten disgusted with the, the, the kind of uh, mainstream culture that they're in and, and they're more accepting perhaps of, of other point of views and they, they could take in good or bad with that. But we saw that of course with vampires too, at some point vampires became like these sexy, sexy godlike characters. Yeah, yeah. Rather than something to be, uh, uh, right. to want to run away from, they became something to want to be, you know, yeah. to, to a certain, um, certain number of people. But I'm sure there's, there's, I, I feel confident that there's something to the psychology of that, you know, that something, yeah. of, you know, some kind of veneration for the outsider and in and, and nonconformity, some kind of uh, uh, hopefully new empathy for what was previously considered freakish, you know, yeah. the, but, the kind of respect for the anomalies. But do you ever, and, and that I get that, uh, do you ever worry slightly about, uh, like, I guess what I'm asking is, is fear in any way a part of, of what you're doing? Like, I know you're not trying to incite fear of of actual beings but then there's also i mean i've i'm probably not going out on a limb to say that the average uh member of the satanic temple has had a, a relationship to fear in their lives where um like myself i'm not a satanic temple member but i've sought out the darkest bleakest um movies and and imagery at times um specifically because it you know as you become numb uh to to things in life fear has that ability to kind of kick you kick you out of it out of numbness or something like that do you ever worry about um any of these imagery images losing losing their power to titillate with fear not i don't worry about the supernatural images uh losing their their power to uh to, to frighten people. Um, I think, you know, I, I, what I would just worry about is people going too far to justify, uh, counterproductive or antisocial behavior, mm. um, because they're trying to embrace some kind of outsider denigrated character. Right. I mean, I remember like there was a really real true crime craze, throughout the 90s and in the early 2000s. And uh, it, it got to the point where it seemed like people were really glorifying serial killers, completely forgetting that there okay. were victims behind them, you know? Like, uh, and, and I was always really irritated by a certain counterculture segments, veneration of Charles Manson. Right. Uh, I, and, and I understood where it came from that's i did not i but i didn't i didn't think any of it was right right like uh yeah it, it, people take a take the leap where they go from this isn't presented as uh in the same way that it actually is in reality to all of a sudden justifying it in, in its entirety and that's what happened with charles manson manson was being kind of promoted by the media as this uh as this horrific, uh, as this horrific man with uh, hypnotic control over people, and they could not but do his bidding. You know, he was this hmm. cult master and all that kind of thing. When really he was just, you know, from what I could see and what I think of Manson is just being a, a, a stumbling idiot. You know, with a bunch of deranged and, and moronic ideas, and uh, he would he was kind of like. He, he was kind of like the Deepak Chopra of his day. He would just say <laughs> things that were paradoxical or nonsensical, and people would ascribe this great meaning to them. 
Right. People went from, you know, just realizing that he wasn't what they were saying he was to then pretending that he hadn't done anything wrong, which was, right. which was nonsense. Here was a guy who carved a swastika into his head and try in, had a murdered, had a yeah. pregnant woman murdered so that he could start some kind of race war in which he would uh, elevate himself somehow. Yeah. Uh, it, the man was an absolute, the man was a fool. Yeah. Um, it, and that, that's, that's what I worry about when people kind of take that turn from, from uh, seeing beyond the veil only so far is to then take it way too far in another direction. Right. So then, yeah. So uh, if, if I had the feeling that you were the type of person who was looking to use fear to incite fear in the, in the public, in a real way or to incite violence of any kind. I mean, I would just have no interest in talking to you, but uh, so I, I definitely in asking about fear, I'm not, uh, not implying any of that stuff. I just think. No, actually the, the Baphomet monument is, is fascinating in that regard because, you know, I was working with the guy who was sculpting it mm -hmm. and he kept coming back with these versions of the head and, uh, he, he, his initial impulse was to give it a very stern kind of evil expression, you know, the furrowed eyes right. and everything. And I kept telling him, no, 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 soften the features. I want the features to be neutral. You know, this isn't, this isn't evil. This is, this is yeah. just what it is. Right. right. And, and I, I didn't want people's like uh, emotional reaction to Baphomet to be driven by that kind of notion of what it's, uh, emotional features were trying to imply right you know and i felt like it was very successful in the end you know yeah. the f features are very neutral you know it just uh and, and it looks i think uh it has that look of benevolence and understanding yeah and uh it's just funny to see what people make of it you know yeah. it de it really depends on what kind of baggage they bring to it and it's it's right. it's, it's it's gratifying to see in that way to see people come up and say this is a beautiful work of art this yeah. uh, you know signifies something very lovely and other people look at it and say this is a horrific monster and i can't believe you would ever yeah. think for a moment that anybody would want this on the public grounds and it's right. a, it's just amazing to hear what different people see yeah through a different set of eyes but with different kind of yeah. mental filters bringing it to them well there's a lot of psychology and philosophy that imagery brings brings to the surface and turns it into behavior turns it into emotion uh that can really only happen through a symbol uh you know through some kind of symbology um and so yeah i mean i i that that's really cool to hear has anybody had like a, a an extremely emotional kind of spiritual reaction to the baphomet statue like it breaking down or uh, well i i've seen uh you know this is another thing that that some people won't won't understand, but we actually do have rituals and, and ritual events. But they're, you know, there's still non-theistic. There's no supernatural component to them. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that we're summoning spirits or anything like that. Yeah, they're cathartic experiences. Right. They're uh, you know a, a lot of activities that kind of use applied psychology. Uh, one of the people I work with, Shiva, is putting out a book of these kinds of rituals and talking about their kind of psychological value that people, they have for people yeah. and things like that. Um, she authors a lot of this stuff and, and I don't, you know, I, I like to see these things kind of emerge from the, the chapter structure and, and the people who identify with us. Mm -hmm. But um, Shiva does these things, these destruction rituals and, uh, a component of that is where people kind of write down something they want to uh, be rid of in their life or they bring a small object of something that, you know, they're purging themselves or whatever. It's lit on fire and then dumped into some kind of uh, uh, vase or whatever with yeah. wine or something like that. And during those things, which sometimes take place at the Baphomet monument, you know, you'll see very, uh, very emotional reactions from people right you know? so um it's you know uh i think it just goes to show that you know non-theistic religion isn't a isn't type a type of oxymoronical term like right. you really see 
yeah. you know, if you spend time in any of our chapters or if you spend time in, in here in Salem with the activities of the Satanic Temple, this really operates in the way a religion operates for people. Right. It's a religion of the people who follow it, and I don't know what more, yeah, what more one could need. Yeah. Well, and the spirit, I mean, you, uh, spiritual can mean the human spirit, you know, like the the maybe unacknowledged parts of ourselves or the subconscious and all of that as well. Um, so, yeah, I was curious, though, do, are there members? I mean, I'm assuming you don't the seven tenets that you have, they don't preclude. They don't preclude that somebody might have a spiritual belief or an occult um, an actual belief. Am I right in thinking that? Like it's, it's, no, you're, like you're, you're right. And in fact, I, I've explained this, uh, you know, I, this often comes up in Q and A's also where people will say, you know, I want to identify with the satanic temple, but I have, you know, a specific set of yeah. uh, beliefs that can't be, you know, proven or whatever. And I always tell them that the, uh, the position against supernaturalism and against, uh, or, you know, that uh, precludes theism is organizational. It's not necessarily right. individual, right? I think, yeah. you know, uh, superstitious beliefs, theistic beliefs, they're not, uh, they're, they're only problematic necessarily if, if they're counterproductive to the person who holds them, of course. Right. But if that person trying to impose something that can't be proven, you know, something that's an item of faith. Right to others and as an organization right. it would run kind of contrary to our anti-autocratic philosophy right to take anything that we don't have any any real world evidence for and dictate that people must believe in that right so it's it's an organizational viewpoint if, if somebody is in uh is in a chapter or is in a member or whatever and they they privately I mean, they don't have to remain silent about it necessarily, right. but they they just can't insist that anybody else believe as they do. Right. I guess that's something that I've thought about quite a bit because, um, you know, as I like, as my Christian faith has been like, just <laughs> just t totally pulled inside out and, and shoved all around by life in, in general, uh, is that we've lost, a, I mean, a lot of religions uh, have lost the um, the subjective um, nature have lost sight of the subjective nature of their beliefs. In other words, um, the the fact that somebody's experience of God or somebody's experience of talking to the dead or somebody's experience is is for them. Their experience is theirs. It's for them. And and so like some of these things where people are debating the ex you know with a scientist and a Christian debating the existence of God as though they're talking about two objective phenomena like I, I i think that's that that just doesn't sit well with me so um yeah no i i you know I, I don't like to i certainly won't talk shit on the atheist community because you know they, uh, we've gotten a lot of interest i speak at atheist conferences a lot of times and things like that but the the discussions to me i i have to admit uh, they're just they're just boring and tedious after a yeah. time there's only so much I can, I can talk about, you know, why I believe in one thing and don't believe in another or, or whatever else. Um, yeah. I, I, I really don't, I really don't care yeah. what, what people believe. Um, I, I think it's counterproductive, of course, if they choose to believe something that's provably false, you know, mm -hmm. something that really runs contrary to what, we right. do know based on credible evidence, that kind of thing. But if they're kind of filling in the unknowns, the gaps with what they feel it must be, and they realize that that's what they're doing, you know, right. that at least they're flexible to it. Like, well, who really cares? And in so far as, you know, theistic religions congregating and that kind of thing, who cares, right? Like right. my concern is when they're, bringing it into the public square, trying to gain exclusive privilege. Right. You have politicians pandering to tribalism over pluralism. Uh, then you have real serious problems. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's what, that's what's happening when we, when we try to uh, put a, a coat of makeup over the United States and, you know, and the West, uh, a Christian coat of makeup, we put, you know, it doesn't make the face underneath it. 
you know, reflect the, the face of God. It doesn't put anything deeper into, you know, it just gussies over the, you know, the, the cesspool. I mean, a, a, a divided nation that, that, uh, I mean, it's not, a, I'm not describing America as only a cesspool, but like, I'm just saying that putting a Christian face on it doesn't take away any of the well, evangelical nationalism has become a real kind of cesspool of religion. And yeah. I, I have to think, you know, well, we did see the, uh, the controversy with Christianity today um, coming out against Trump. And it's a real popular evangelical right. magazine that kind of came out from left field. And then uh, Trump accused the magazine of being some kind of uh, extreme liberal publication, which was laughable. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, before then, before there was those indications at all, I was just thinking how bizarre it was that there weren't at least some evangelicals really concerned that this, you know, even though they might feel they have power now with him being in there, that they, they stand to lose all credibility for having given up, it seems, everything they claim to stand for yeah. just to have that power in the White House, you yeah. know, just to abdicate all their moral norms, which, you know, they premise their whole foundation upon uh, yeah. is now been kind of thrown out the window uh, just so they can have this kind of direct uh, view in the policy. I, I feel like that's a you know, and, and they really seem to be coming out ahead, but I still think that the gamble is just too much. You know, yeah. I, 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 I really don't think the satanic temple would be, would, would be uh, such a thing if right. it weren't for that irresponsibility on the other side. I mean, they, they've driven so many people away, you yeah. know, and, and a percentage of them come to us, you know, and find a new sense of community. And right. you see that even in the documentary, you know, we have a guy, Mason, who's famous for wearing his bow tie in the... Oh, yeah. Oop. Oh, shoot. Hang on. You're frozen. Uh, hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, I've got you back and we're still recording. Sorry, Mason with the bow tie. Yeah, he, he was an evangelical and he felt alienated by the, the path that evangelicals were taking. And, and, you know, he's not he's not a rare story. Yeah. You know. Yeah, no. And when, when all is said and done, this this might be the, the ruination of. Of uh, the evangelical identification. Uh, yeah, you know, I I um I definitely hope it's the uh, I definitely hope it's the end of this seemingly unified evangelical voice because you, yeah you're you're talking about I, I mean I I know I probably know more people who identify as Christian who don't like Donald Trump than the other way around it's just uh, somehow there that there, there's not a system or a um, you know there's not a pipeline for them to 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 be a part of that voice necessarily like it's kind of that. Yeah, I mean, they're not militant, they're not organized, and I hope that kind of changes in the future. Like, personally, I, I, I feel like, uh, like I felt a real kinship with you and with your, um, with your purposes when I was watching that movie. Like, not every single thing, every single moment, but the spirit of it, uh, the spirit of it was, was life-affirming and 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 so I really do hope that that more people, especially in 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 the form of a vote, uh, will um, will show themselves to to not believe that that Donald Trump is uh, speaking for or representing Christianity or Christian Christian morals in any way, like uh, and, and and actually make that known in the near future. No, I hope so too. And kind of back to that question of if I'm concerned of taking away the fear from certain monsters that, that people have traditionally held on to, I feel like the situation is that if in the in future generations, you know, uh satanic temples are saying they want to put up a a monument next to some Christian memorial or whatever else that 
the prevalent response from reasonable people would just be like, that's oh, the Satanists. They're just another damn religion. Like, why not? You know, yeah. <laughs> like the knee jerk reaction would be like, well, who are you to say they can't if the other guys are like, you know, right. I, I would hope that like in the future, that would be the mainstream response, uh, even from publicly engaged Christians who yeah. understand what religious freedom actually means. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, like if, uh, if you guys get your Baphomet up, I would hope that, uh, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a Buddhist community would, you know, w- would be like, oh, you know, that's kind of interesting. Maybe we have a chance. To, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I kind of think it is weird to have uh, religious symbols on these legislative grounds to begin with. But it, if, it, if it's a thing, you know, I, I hope that other people take advantage of it as well and get some, get some ideas out there, you know, get some, some symbolism out there. And I don't know, it feels like a weird time. It feels like a weird time for our nation where our symbol our, our symbolism is um increasingly either co-opted or meaningless you know and uh the baphomet obviously still has some power as a symbol but um yeah i'm just i'm just curious how other symbols will what other symbols might might come up or what other kind of I don't know. It's a, it's a really weird kind of feels like a turning point. I, this is not a question. I'm just, ri- I'm just literally processing what we're talking no, about. You're, you're right. It, it, but it's, it's another thing that kind of speaks to the kamikaze course that the evangelical nationalists are on now with the Blandensburg cross ruling, which was a recent Supreme court ruling that we knew would go in favor of putting this, uh, of keeping this large cross on this, these public grounds. They, they use the same kind of argument that was used in Austin to keep a, Ten Commandments monument up, whereas uh, they were saying that there was no evidence of religious discrimination, which was r- really kind of bizarre because they they kind of put like the the hurdle to be like there need to be like affirmative evidence of the intention of just uh, of keeping other religions out or having an exclusive viewpoint put on the public grounds, rather than just acknowledging that that was the outcome by doing this. You know, right. it was yeah. silly, but. You know, but they were also saying, well, it was already there for over 40 years. So now it's a historical landmark. And it's one of those things where it was like, within God, we trust on the money. It's ceremonial and patriotic. And at what point uh, do they have to start becoming concerned about having de-Christianized Christian symbols? You're actually right. claiming now that a cross on the public grounds has nothing to do with Christianity or that. The yeah, that's messed up. Yeah, or that the Ten Commandments monument has no no real sacred value, but secular value. At what point uh, do believers get pissed and say, yeah. you know, it's not good for the government to say that this is something of theirs, that this is secular, right. but this is something that's meaningful and sacred to us? Like, right. I, I just, it's it's kind of troubling to me that more people don't don't understand it in that way right. that they're yeah. not really that the only person really gaining from these things are the uh are the politicians that know that it panders to a certain group right. of people but it, in the long run you know they they've they've neutered their symbols yeah and they, they they've changed their meaning they've disempowered yeah. themselves in a certain way in oh, their absolutely. search for power that's a very that's a very um observant that's a, yeah that's a very insightful thing to say um, I'll tell you what it feels like to me with um, the way that the the West is with Christianity and with religion in general. I, I had always felt like I, I fight two different I fight two different temptations. One is to think we're ready to transcend uh, religion, and the other is that how could we possibly transcend religion? Like you know, you don't transcend something if you're not all, if you you don't understand it, fully realize it, you and you choose to transcend it. But then but then the image came to my mind the other day that. We're actually more like uh, a um, we're more like an agrarian tribe. So if we make it into a, a very um, sort of uh, pre-technology situation, we're more like an agrarian tribe that has been living off of a certain crop, and the, over time, the soil and the conditions, the weather, everything, uh, the predators, all of this stuff has has changed, and our crops are dying, and uh, we are faced with the decision of basically becoming nomadic or, or like, and, and that's how it feels like we're kind of squabbling because imagine the conversations in a, in a village 
where they were like, look, we've got to stop living in these huts that we've built and we've got to start moving to where these, you know, herds of caribou are or whatever. Imagine like how people would resist that and how some people who it was their natural tendency, they might, they might say, great. Yeah, let's do that. Fuck these houses, you know, like, but like, that's, that's kind of how it feels like it's, it's this kind of, to me, it's this kind of transcendence that's necessitated just by the fact that the well is the well of the way this, that religion has been done, the well of the way that we've been thinking and the basis of our thinking is kind of drying up and the, and the, um, the soil is changing its salinity level or whatever. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, no, I, I mean, we are at a cultural crossroads and mm -hmm. I feel like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll never know fully what our place is in it, but I think the way people approach the question of Satanism now is already so different from when we started, mm. where I think more and more people are realizing that there's a potentially respectable point of view right. attached to this. And I think we can't possibly know necessarily all of what that does to the rest of culture, but I like to think it's deeply profound. And when yeah. I see even the subtle things, uh, the subtle missteps of the evangelical nationalists, I I uh, I can't say I lament what I think they're destroying, but I think they're uh, they're they're so they're so blind by immediate greed, yeah, and, and that's so apparent that uh, that they're they're destroying any chance for people to even possibly see them as what they want to be seen as, right. yeah. The big difference between me and you is I, I do lament it. You know, I, I uh, just on, on a personal level, it, it's very um, it's very saddening to have um, the thing because I really think that my my Christian faith. I mean, it's been the bedrock of my life. It's been it's been the consistent story. And um, and even as I become uh, an independent thinker, this is not a this is not a sales pitch for Christianity. But even as I become an independent thinker, even as I warm to people like yourself um, and, and look for, and I'm, even as I look for wisdom and care anywhere where it lives, I still feel, I still feel like some of that framework was provided to me by, uh, you know, in these lessons that I learned as a child. So yeah, I mean, uh, I, I totally understand why you I don't mean, it. I mean, it may sound odd, but I can, I can totally, I can totally feel that. Like if I, I know, if I felt that, you know, if I had been in some kind of Christian community, I don't think I could ever have grown up to be a believer, but right. I could see myself in circumstances where, you know, I really enjoyed a certain community I was in and the good works that they did and everything. And, uh, you know, if they were doing good things that I would still agree today were good things. Yeah. Um, and, and I saw what's going on today, I would feel like, I would feel like that entire background, that entire community was being directly shit upon, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and everything it had built up, everything it was trying to convey, everything it was trying to bring into the world was being called into question now by some greedy, irresponsible people. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that is how it feels. And honestly, like, uh, uh, people are looking for wisdom and care for other human beings wherever it can be found. And I've seen that, I've seen that in what you're doing. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm really glad to, to get a chance to talk to you. Um, I, I want people to watch the documentary. I want people to think critically. Um, I want people to oppose the people you're opposing. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I just want, I think we're at an hour and 20 minutes here, so I don't want to maximize your time, but, uh, I, I appreciate your generosity of spirit. Uh, and I appreciate, uh, yeah, you, you're just having this conversation with me today. Great. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Check in with me anytime. Thank you very much. Is there anything else like that this brought up that you want to say before it's all over or? Nah, just keep a lookout on our, we've always got things going on. So if people mm -hmm. are interested in the updates, just keep a lookout for us on our website, the satanic temple.com and check out our social media. But uh, yeah, we're, we're never, 
we're we're never short of uh, new activities to uh, to observe and and uh, and possibly participate in. I mean, we have uh, either an active chapter or nascent friends of group chapter in each of the fifty states right now. So so oh, wow. keep a look at what is yeah. the what is the total number? Do you know of chapters and friends of groups? Yeah. Uh, well over 50 because we have international presences yeah. too. So yeah, I don't, I don't even know. We have so, one here in Edmonton. Well, anyway, thanks one. Lucian Greaves. This has been a great chat and I'm assuming based on what you're saying, you're okay with me putting this up. I always offer people the chance for me not to, not to put this on the internet. Oh no, no. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, thanks very much. And, and, uh, I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. It was great to meet you. Great. It was great meeting you. Thank you. Thanks Lucian.